Amen. We right now are among those who are blessed even though we have not seen him. But we will one day, according to Revelation chapter 22 and verse 4, see his face. Praise the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer and then we will begin this morning. Lord Jesus, indeed, we thank you and praise you for the abundance of the grace that we have received from God through you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you again. I pray that you would bless us this morning in the wisdom of your word as we continue in this sixth chapter of Ephesians. Lord, that chapter that your spirit moved the Apostle Paul to pen many years ago concerning the armor, I praise you and thank you that we are in your service. I pray that you would bless us this morning with wisdom and insight, that your spirit would guide and direct our minds and cause us to be attentive to your truth and his leadership in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Ephesians chapter 6. We are going to be looking specifically this morning at verse 14 again. We were in this verse last week as we considered the first piece of the spiritual armor, that is, the belt of truth, or as this particular verse says it, having girded your loins with truth this morning by God's grace, we are going to begin to look at the second piece of the armor of God, and that is the breastplate of righteousness. So let's begin by looking at verse 14 this morning. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. As we have clearly seen through this text, as we have been moving through it beginning in verse 10, we see that, the, that instrumental in the Christian spiritual warfare, instrumental to standing firm, to standing fast, is being clothed not with one or two pieces of the armor of God, but with the full armor of God. And unless the Christian is clothed in the full armor of God, he or she is not going to be able to stand, as the text conveys to us here, against the schemes of the devil. We will consistently be thwarted in our struggle, our spiritual warfare, by, as conveyed in verse 12, world forces, powers, rulers, and these are all spiritual beings here, ultimately, against the world forces of this darkness and spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. They will consistently dog us while we are here, but they don't have to thwart our living for God unless, of course, we fail to don the armor of God. And as we continue this morning, we're looking at that second piece of armor, the breastplate of righteousness. And in particular, as we go on, we're going to see that this breastplate of righteousness pertains to practical righteousness in the life of the believer. But we'll see how that righteousness is different from other righteousnesses that are mentioned in Scripture. But before we do, we need to recognize that the apostle was using these various pieces of real armor to convey the practical truths of spiritual armor to our lives. Whenever you go back into the Old Testament times, you'll find and discover that an archaeology has revealed this to us as well as various texts in Scripture that the breastplate in those that period of time uh, was usually a, a single piece of armor, and it it could entail many kinds of materials, and each each breastplate being different from 
another. There were various forms of them. They sometimes were made out of animal hooves that were cut and sewn together in a fashion so that they would overlap one another. Other pieces of armor had small, thin, metallic discs that were woven together and sewn together. Sometimes they were sewn over leather. Sometimes it was strictly the metal. And sometimes the um, the breastplate consisted of just thick material, leather uh, from an animal. And all of it was, in essence, one piece that was instrumental in protecting the upper body of the soldier, the vital organs of the soldier. Now, the breastplate also was oftentimes tied together with the belt. We talked about the fact that the belt was instrumental last week in a soldier's armor in order to pull in all the loose ends. Well, the breastplate was either attached to the belt or sometimes the breastplate extended down beneath the belt to the groin area and the belt stretched around the waist, pulling the breastplate in tight in close to the body. But however it was made or however it was worn or however it was connected to the belt, ultimately it was designed with the purpose involved, um, of, of protecting the soldier from frontal attacks that he could see, as well as attacks that could come from behind that he couldn't see. We could say it was instrumental in protecting him from overt attacks and covert attacks. Both of those, the breastplate was instrumental in protection. So we could also see that it was a, it was a defensive piece of armor. It was instrumental in the soldier's protection. Now in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 14, Paul likened righteousness to a breastplate. And he said, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. In addition to wearing the belt of truth then, as we saw, the Christian in his armor is to have on or to be found wearing this breastplate. He is the one then who is, as he wears those with other pieces, as we'll eventually see, they are all instrumental in him standing firm and resisting the spiritual battle against the devil and his demonic hosts. The Christian is to have on the breastplate of righteousness. The word breastplate, by the way, here in the Greek is the word we get our English word thorax from. And it pertains specifically to that upper body. And it encompasses everywhere the particular, the breastplate in particular would, would cover not only the front, the back, but it would also sometimes cover the shoulders. Goliath's armor, for instance, in the Old Testament, whenever it is spoken of there, his breastplate alone exceeded a hundred pounds. Exceeded actually 120 pounds. And it was instrumental, obviously, in protecting him. So whenever we come to this breastplate of righteousness this morning, we're going to see that it's instrumental in the protection of the believer. There's multiple kinds of righteousnesses mentioned in Scripture. There's the righteousness of God. That's his intrinsic righteousness that pertains specifically to the very nature of God. There is the imputed righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll look at that a little bit more in detail here in a few moments. But that was a righteousness that belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is also the practical righteousness of Christians. That righteousness that extends from the imputed righteousness of Christ. 
But then there is another righteousness that is mentioned in Scripture, and it is interesting because it is actually not a righteousness at all. It is referred to as self-righteousness. And we need to understand that first and foremost this morning, the Apostle Paul, whenever he's telling the Christian to have on this breastplate of righteousness, obviously he's not speaking to and about self-righteousness. And we see that as we begin to define self-righteousness. And whenever we look at a technical definition of self-righteousness, we see that it speaks to the idea of a person in and of himself or herself, with or without assistance from God's grace, is an attempt to merit or earn or satisfy in some way God's law and thereby be justified. That's the technical definition of self-righteousness. It's interesting that before the Apostle Paul was saved, he commended that kind of righteousness. In the book of Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, he says, concerning the righteousness of the law, speaking about himself, blameless. In other words, he was saying, I had my own righteousness compared to the law I was blameless. Blameless. This particular righteousness, as you're aware of, was the righteousness that belonged to the Pharisees. It was that very righteousness that Jesus in Matthew chapter uh, 5 and 20 said, that that righteousness must be exceeded in order for a person to enter into heaven. I know your bulletin says chapter 6, but it's actually chapter 5 of Matthew. Matthew 5 and 20 says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So in a single word, what Jesus was doing, or a single statement, what he was doing is he was actually condemning that self-righteousness of the Pharisees and saying that unless the righteousness that you have exceeds that of the Pharisees and the scribes, you're not going to get into heaven. What Jesus did is he took the very best of man from man's perspective and demonstrated it's worthless. It's worthless. Later on, he, in the same chapter, and moved down to verse 48, he demonstrated that the requirement of heaven is perfection. Perfection. So after you do all that you can do, you still can't get into heaven. Because he requires perfection. And no one in and of himself is perfect. As a matter of fact, in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 27, Jesus said that the Pharisees and the scribes were nothing more than whitewashed tombs. They were just whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they were very beautiful. Very ornate. Sometimes we have seen caskets that are lined with silver on the outside and gold and all kinds of things that are beautiful. But what is on the inside is dead flesh. That's what Jesus said to them. They're beautiful on the outside, but on the inside... They're full of dead men's bones. In its essence, self-righteousness is also hypocritical righteousness because it conveys the idea that man has the ability to keep God's law when in fact he can't keep God's law. The law itself wasn't given to him 
to show that he could keep it. It was given to man to demonstrate that he lacked the ability and that he was indeed a sinner. That's clearly stated in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. I'll ask you to look at that text with me. Romans 3 and 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. It's interesting, after Paul's conversion, that he rejected self-righteousness. Compare those texts there in Philippians chapter 3. Again, you'll remember in verse 6, as he described himself as a Pharisee, he said, as to the law, blameless. But then as he went on, he didn't refer to it as something he pursued any longer. He changed it. And he said, not having a righteousness of my own. That's the self-righteousness in Philippians chapter 3 that he was speaking of. A righteousness that was not of his own. Self-righteousness. And he went on to describe in verses 7 and 8 that that righteousness, that self-righteousness, he inevitably referred to it as a loss. He referred to it as dung, as refuse, as garbage. The Greek word is skubalon, and it means dung, refuge, waste in the street. That's self-righteousness. So obviously that would not be the righteousness that Paul is calling Christians to with regard to the breastplate of righteousness. And we know that and we understand that. And you might think that, well, why would you even cover that? That should be obvious. And for those that are taught in the Word of God, it is obvious. But for the unlearned in the Word of God, it's not quite so obvious even today. Even the Roman Catholic Church today has at its essence in its doctrine concerning righteousness a self-righteousness that is in view. Because what it says is, is that God will justify you as He over time, as you keep certain sacraments, He infuses into you righteousness. You keep the sacrament of baptism, you keep the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, and as you do that, along with others, you will be infused with righteousness and inevitably justified by God. That's self-righteousness. You can throw some technical terms at it, but nevertheless, boil it all down, and what comes to the top is self-righteousness. Paul said, I didn't want a righteousness of my own. And that brings us to God's righteousness. The righteousness of God. That speaks to His very nature. And you look in your Bibles to Psalm 119, 137. Psalm 119 and verse 137. When we talk about the nature of God, He is righteous in his nature. Verse 137 says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright in your judgments. Verse 142, again, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. Although the righteousness to which the Apostle Paul refers to here in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, as the breastplate of righteousness, it certainly has a relationship to the righteousness of God. It's not the righteousness of God that Paul has in mind specifically here in 6.14. Another righteousness is the imputed righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is another aspect of righteousness, and 
This righteousness is first the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's made evident to us by Christ's sinless life. You remember the devil came to him and tempted him in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, and our Lord did not sin. And in Hebrews chapter 4, we read there that Christ was without sin. Not merely that he didn't sin, but that he had no sin. He, as the Bible refers to him as, was the righteous one. It's a righteousness that God imputes whenever we talk about it with regard to that word imputation. When we're speaking about the imputated righteousness, we're talking about that righteousness that belongs to Jesus Christ that God imputes or charges to the account of the Christian whenever he or she believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is solely a divine transaction that takes place. In this transaction, God, when Christ suffered and died on the cross, He charged to Christ the sins of His people and punished Christ for them on their behalf. God poured out His righteousness after having charged the sins of the people of Christ, those for whom He died. He poured out His righteousness on Christ, having charged their sins to Him. And then, whenever they in time believed, God reckoned the righteousness of Christ to their account, and they were justified. He imputed, not infused, but imputed. He declared them righteous on the basis of the righteousness of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that God made Christ who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. It's an imputed righteousness. In Reformed circles, it's referred to as alien righteousness. It's an alien righteousness because it's not a righteousness that's in and of ourselves. It's Christ's righteousness. It belongs to Him. Its origin is in Him. And it was charged to our account. What a praise that is. So we have a righteousness, but not of ourselves, as Paul said in Romans or Philippians chapter 3, but a righteousness that is of Christ. And praise the Lord for that righteousness. It's a righteousness that is reckoned to us on the basis of faith. The Bible tells us clearly in Romans chapter 4, verses 3 through 5, God or Paul there speaking about Abraham, he quotes the Old Testament and says that Abraham believed God and it was credited to him, or reckoned to him, or charged to him as righteousness. And then as Romans chapter 5 begins, the text in verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. That justification came as that righteousness was credited to our account. And we were at peace with God. Praise the Lord. But notice our text in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14. It says, Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, what's important about that text? is the fact that that little phrase, having put on in the Greek, is the middle, is in the middle voice. And what that means is that the subject himself is acting on himself. 
And so whenever it's speaking about the Christian there, it's depicting the Christian putting on this breastplate. But in imputed righteousness, that's God's transaction. That's, what's, that's what God is doing. So the imputed righteousness of Christ is not what's in view here because that's what God's done in our lives. We need to address what it is that we are responsible to do. And that brings us to this practical righteousness, the righteousness specifically to which the Apostle, the, the Apostle Paul is referring to here. We could say that although imputed righteousness is not this righteousness that's in view, this righteousness that is in view stems from that imputed righteousness. It's a practical righteousness. It's this practical righteousness very specifically that the Paul the Apostle has in mind here. And it makes sense. It is, we could say, as we have said with the other pieces of the armor, complementary to us. It's fitting to us to don the breastplate of practical righteousness. And the reason for that is simple, because one, we possess a new nature. God has birthed us into his kingdom. Secondly, he's imputed to us the righteousness of Christ. So it stands to reason that as individuals examine our lives and as we examine our lives, that we would be clothed and have this practical righteousness stemming from who we are and what God has done in our lives. We would be those who conduct our lives righteously or in righteousness. Now, remember that just as the warrior's belt and breastplate were contiguous, this breastplate being attached to the belt or tucked into it, truth and righteousness are contiguous elements in the spiritual warfare and armor of the Christian. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah, righteousness and faithfulness or truthfulness were both likened to a belt to one in the same. That's in Isaiah 11, 5. And that demonstrates their closeness in relation to each other. As a Christian wears the belt of truth, he walks daily in obedience to the word of truth. We looked last week at that and saw that, that God sanctifies us with his word. His word is truth from John 17, 17. And doing so, we adorn ourselves in the breastplate of of righteousness. Practical righteousness then is in essence the result of being a doer of God's Word. You do God's Word, you're exhibiting that righteousness. You've placed on that breastplate of righteousness and it's instrumental in protecting the believer. The apostle applied the imagery of the breastplate to practical righteousness, beloved, in order to illustrate the efficacy of living a holy life in the midst of ongoing spiritual warfare in this present world. The soldier's breastplate, you remember, wrapped around the entire warrior. It served as a kind of barrier separating the warrior's vital organs from the enemy's weapons. Consequently, as it was instrumental in insulating the warrior against frontal attacks as well as those that came from behind. Thus, the warrior's vital organs were protected from the assaults he could see coming as well as those that were not immediately noticeable. He had liberty in his life to wage warfare and to live out a life of a soldier in the midst of war without worrying about attacks that he couldn't see and know that he was guarded against those that he could see. In regard to practical righteousness, it is defensive. 
it serves as a kind of spiritual barrier in the life of the Christian that's instrumental in separating the believer from the fallen world system, or in other words, the enemy's weapons, that is, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life in 1 John 2.16. And thereby it insulated the believer, or insulates the believer from overt and covert spiritual attacks. Practical righteousness, and we need to understand this closely, Practical righteousness, as it protects us, it's not going to prevent the believer from suffering. It's not going to stop suffering. But one thing that practical righteousness will do, and this is extremely important, it is instrumental in minimizing the suffering that you might experience or incur from your own sins. So important for us to understand the significance of this practical righteousness. Donning the breastplate of righteousness. Living out a righteous life protects us from our own sins and the consequences thereof. It's instrumental in keeping us from sin. A life lived in practical righteousness is instrumental in comforting the mind of the believer in the midst of suffering. As that believer knows that his suffering is for the Lord, not his own immediate sin. So important. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles with me to another text of Scripture this morning. Go with me to First Peter. Now, Peter isn't using the phrase breastplate of righteousness here, but he's dealing with a similar situation, and you'll see that become evident in the text. But notice in First Peter chapter 1, and I'll ask you to go to verse 14 with me. He says, as obedient children, 1 Peter 1, 14, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, in your ignorance. And then notice what he said. But, like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now, whenever we talk about the word holiness, we're talking about righteousness as well. They are extremely similar. There can be some differences in the sense that whenever holiness is mentioned, it has the idea of separateness as well as a righteousness. It has the idea of being separated from everything as well as being pure in that separation. Whenever we talk about God being holy, He is separate from the world. He is different and another from it. And in that holy condition, He is also righteous. He's righteous in His nature, and He's righteous in all that He does. As Christians, we're not of this world. We're in it, but we're not of it. We're another in that sense. And we are also called in this world to be righteous. We are to exhibit the characteristic of our Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness. So Peter says here, and notice the connection, as obedient children, he's speaking to believers, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in ignorance, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves, and notice this, also in all your behavior. He's talking about what we do. And he's telling us, in essence, put on that breastplate of righteousness. Be holy in your behavior. Now, move with me to the second chapter of First Peter. Second Peter, chapter 2. And move down to verse 9 with me. 
He says there, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you, as aliens and strangers, to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And notice verse 12. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God on the day or in the day of visitation. He's exhorting us to live righteously. Verse 12, keep your behavior excellent. He's not just saying excellent in a general sense. The context of this overall, back up into chapter 1, has to do with holy behavior, righteous conduct, maintaining the breastplate of righteousness as we live in this crooked and perverted world. Now jump over to chapter 4 with me for a moment. As I mentioned to you earlier, having on this breastplate of righteousness isn't going to stop all of our suffering. We're engaged in warfare. We're going to be impacted by the devil. But what we don't want to be impacted by the devil with is our own sins. And that's what Peter is addressing here. Notice in verse 12, he says, Beloved, 1 Peter 4.12, Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you. Now, isn't that interesting? He's exhorting them, don't be surprised at the assaults that you're going to endure and are enduring in the world, which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. You know, isn't that the way it works with Christians? We, If we manage to don the entire armor of God, and we start out in our Christian walk in life and we're suited up for battle, and, and by God's grace we're wearing it, all of a sudden we start suffering. You know one of the first things we start to do? What's going on? I thought I had the whole armor on. I, why am I feeling this way if I'm a Christian? Why am I experiencing all of these trials if I'm a believer? I thought I, if I had the armor on, everything's going to be just sell merrily, merrily, merrily. Life is but a dream. That ain't going to happen. Because the more you're fortified against the enemy, the stronger the enemy is going to have to work, isn't he? But praise the Lord, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Notice as Peter goes on here, he says, but to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory, you may rejoice with exultation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, look at this, you are blessed. Because the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Make sure, and look at verse 15 closely, make sure that none of you suffers as a murderer or thief or evildoer or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in this name. As I mentioned, beloved, Donning that breastplate of righteousness won't prevent us from being suffered, from suffering and experiencing trials. But what it will do, it will insulate us from the sin of the world and from our own sin as we keep that breastplate on. We can move forward in the battle without worrying about past guilt, without worrying about past sins circling around to find or discover someone. That's a praise and a blessing. A great one in all of our lives. We could say really that together the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, they shore up the believer so that we are faithful, so that we are fervent, fruitful 
and fearless in the spiritual battle. Listen to Psalm 1 and look there in your Bibles. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. And he shall be like the tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. Its leaf also will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper. But the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the ungodly will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation, and listen to this, of the righteous. God's breastplate of righteousness, that practical righteousness in our lives, is instrumental in making us faithful, fervent, you can see it here in this text, faithful, blessed is the man that does not do these things, fervent, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, fruitful, his leaf will not wither, it will bring forth its fruit in its season, and its leaf will not wither, and fearless. We don't have to worry on judgment day. What a praise, what a blessing that is. Daniel exhibited that in Daniel chapter 1, verse 8, where the Bible says that he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. Daniel was faithful. He was fervent. He was fruitful. And he was fearless. How about the three Hebrew use whenever you move in Daniel over to that third chapter in verses 16 through 18. Turn there in the Word of God and notice their response to Belshazzar as they stood in front of a fiery furnace. And on the other hand, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, was commanding them as the king that they were to bow down. And their response to him, very simple, very clear, in verse 16. <clears throat> Bear with me while I get over there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Those men, were faithful, they were fervent, they were fearless, and they were fruitful. As a matter of fact, you in one sense and I in that same sense are evidence of their fruitfulness. How many times have we been comforted by these words spoken by them as penned here by God's prophet through the work of His Holy Spirit? God delivered them. And that's a praise. But their lives weren't to change in their righteousness, even if God hadn't delivered them. And they made that clear. What about fearlessness? Look in Psalm with me, chapter 112. Psalm 112. Verse 4, speaking of the righteous. Psalm 112 says, Light, and verse 4, arises in the darkness for the upright, 
He is gracious and compassionate and righteous. That's a reference to those who are, they are upright. Their steadfastness with God. Look in the same chapter with me down to verse 6. For he, that is the upright, will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. He will not fear evil tidings. His heart is fixed or it's steadfast trusting in the Lord. Beloved, whenever we've donned that breastplate of righteousness, practical living out of God's truth, so that our lives are insulated in a sense practically from the lost world around us, insofar as the things of the world are concerned that are sinful, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the boastful pride of life, we are armored with an armor that really liberates us and gives us the ability to battle spiritually without the hindrance and the worry of sin and its effects in our lives. That's a great blessing. I'm going to ask you to stand with me this morning. Now, the Christian in this life is not without sin. We know that. We're aware of it. And no Christian that has been educated biblically would make that statement or that claim. But what we do know is that we have a mediator, Christ Jesus the Lord. And He is ever living right now, mediating on our behalf in God's very presence. And we know that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and He's just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's an aspect of donning that righteous, or the breastplate of righteousness, is to confess the sin and to forsake it. What a praise and a blessing that is. And know that whenever that is done, it's forgiven. And we can live out our lives in a practical, righteous manner going forward to the praise of His goodness and glory, armored as His soldiers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Thank you for your grace and its blessing in our lives. Thank you for righteousness, your righteousness, for the imputed righteousness of Christ and for that practical righteousness that you've called us to put on. Not because of anything that we have done, but because of what you have made us and your work within us. Thank you that we can do that through the power of your Holy Spirit. And I pray that you would continue to strengthen us and give us wisdom as we progress through this armor. In Jesus' name, amen.